podcast offering discussions and tutorials on nerdy subjects for people who aren't necessarily nerdy themselves. With you today, myself, it's your nerdy to Georgia with me here today. House survivor, my mom? Yeah. 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 House survivor, or, or at least right now a house survivor still. Yeah. You're yeah. not going stir crazy in your house just yet? Yeah, I am, but that's okay. Well, I think you, you're... We're a, a month, th- month four. Month four, month We're into five. month four, and I think it's okay if you go a little stir crazy while you're at home. It's... It feels right. We've completed four months. We're, we're, we're into we're, month five. We're into month five. Jeez. Yeah. Um, well, what better to talk about today than getting out of your own reality and into a new, brand new spanking reality? I'm willing. So, uh, today I want to talk about virtual reality. So, virtual reality is a two-toned concept to think about here, because virtual reality itself is the con- as a concept is this digital universe of possibilities and then when I also talk about virtuality I talk about a more uh, tangible version which is the more modern VR uh, which again VR meaning virtual reality Reality, headsets and controllers that are um, slowly becoming more prevalent in uh, well I wouldn't say more prevalent but becoming more cost effective okay Um, more affordable more, they're becoming more affordable, but even the most basic models are still not below five hundred dollars in most cases. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, so there's it's still a pretty pretty pricey deal. Yeah, and at the at the same time too, there's not um, what I would call uh, a killer app. So again, so back in the day, um, even now, so a killer app is this notion is that it's this must have application for your device. So. Yes. Um, if we go back to like the early versions of phones, it was uh, of our modern modern day phones, they were cameras. Yeah. That was a kill. You know, if you had a camera in your phone, it was a big deal back in the day. Um, in a lot of cases, if we go back to even further than that, uh, the Sega Genesis killer app was Sonic the Hedgehog, much the same way Nintendo's killer app was Mario. It was Super Mario. Uh, it was the one game you had to have that you could get with the system. But it was the reason that you really pretty much bought the system. Uh, the same was true of the Nintendo Switch. One of the big uh, app, first uh, major you know killer apps for it was the Legend of Zelda game, which again they only come out every so often, um, and it's always a big deal when they come out because there's only been there's only a few there's not a lot of Zelda games. Okay. By comparison, which again could be its own topic, I think at one point, but I have other topics in mind. Okay. Um, but from, uh, and I actually, when I was working, still working in the hotels, I had to be there during a Google conference where a lot of their guys were talking about VR. And I chimed in, oh, yeah, I totally, in, I actually have a VR set, which is what we'll play with at one point. Okay. Um, so you can experience VR for yourself. Um, and they were trying to, um, well, we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that experience here in a little bit here because we want to discuss VR in and of itself first. Okay. So, Virtual reality as it is, the idea of virtual reality is being able to go into a different world or reality that's not our own. You know, things are maybe a little bit different in there. Or it's more idyllic um, in some way, shape, or form. And usually when we say virtual reality, it doesn't necessarily just mean a digital reality. You know, it could be traveling, you know, to a fantasy world through a portal or something. The idea of being virtual being that it's that it's... Pro- that it's something created, I guess, is the better way to put it, maybe? You know, that this world is created, not just homogeneously existing. Well, okay, so so you couldn't have a virtual world that was you in Venice? You could. Where you could have a travel virtual world? Yeah, I mean, and, there, and there's an example, there's examples of that here in, in media that we see. Okay. Um, today, obviously, we think of virtual as being digital in most cases here, like, I don't know anybody who really thinks of virtual as being um, a different kind of reality so much as it's a digital element. Okay. You know, the data is virtual or I know all my friends virtually or, you know, I'll see you online virtually, stuff like that. That's kind of the more common parlance of it. Um, And obviously now with gaming rigs, we have a lot more uh, tangibility to what is a virtual world. But virtual reality is not a new concept at any particular level. Um, Virtuality has existed in a lot of popular media for a very long time. Um, 
and what I mean by virtual me virtual realities and media, I mean this notion of actually going into a virtual world, not necessarily already existing in one, like a sci-fi setting or a... A holodeck. Yes, actually, that's literally one of my examples here is, is Star Trek's in their holodecks. Okay. Um, so, but again, most virtual realities are something that you live in either for a short term or long term. Usually you go in there for either a scenario or you're stuck in there in some cases, depending on the narrative. Um, and again, typically it's usually portrayed in one of two different ways. One of which is either portrayed as a idyllic world that you get to go into and, and, and either do a job in or do something in, in most cases. Um, and the other version is you often see them as prisons. You know, in the sense of where you're trapped in this virtual setting, and you may not even know you're trapped in a virtual setting. You may just be in there, or you are. You realize you're trapped in there, but you can't get out of it. Are we talking about the Jim Carrey movie? Not uh, Jim Carrey. Not necessarily Jim Carrey, but I'm actually probably talking about more the famous version of it, The Matrix. Okay. So, um, and again, most virtual reality requires. Um, for you, some way for you to enter the virtual reality, and usually that might be going into a room, a la Star Trek, um, or you might be going in through it by some sort of uh, headset or controllers or something, um, or you're literally plugged into it like the Matrix, where you literally get jacked in through the back of your spine into <laughs> it. I mean, that's how they do it. It's a, Ow. it's a, yeah, it's, no, I've seen it. But again, I mean, like they, but again, they've kind of already been implanted with these nodes to, yeah. to let you into it. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk about the Matrix. Okay. And this is also kind of a smart, a slight roundabout way of talking about some cool movies and things to watch. In the meantime, while we we're stuck, in, where we're still kind of stuck at home, okay. that's virtual reality related. Okay. Um, so again, probably the most famous version of virtual reality that was initially in the early two thousands and late nineties of modern cinema was the Matrix. Again, this post-apocalyptic world where the machines have taken over the world and they now use humans as batteries because of their constant energy. Um, and the humans are placated by existing in this virtual world that they don't even realize is a virtual at all. It's a modern-day version of Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, any sort of metropolis kind of smashed together. Um, and they exist in this reality that they don't even realize is virtual at all. They just It's just a constant living it all. Um, and obviously you have people from the Matrix who are been liberated from uh, the world at this point, liberated from the Matrix, and can go back into the Matrix at various uh, junction points. But they have the ability to kind of be downloaded with new information and skills. Um, so the very classic thing of Neo being downloaded with uh, martial arts and him wake, kind of waking up and looking at uh, Morpheus and being like, I know Kung Fu. And so this notion of being able to download this data, be able to learn all this stuff. I think what's really happening there when that's happening is that their, their perception of time gets slowed down because of how fast digital knowledge moves. And they're actually being trained in whatever it is they're being trained in. And I'd like to think that they're being, you know, that they've spent, you know, years learning whatever craft that they've been learning. Um, but to us, it takes like seconds because it's it's just so fast digitally, computer generated. Uh, and then you have obviously Neo, who is uh, Keanu Reeves, who is different because he can actually manipulate the world a little bit. He can do things that you're not intended to do, like he can fly, he can... Um, see the Matrix code essentially as it's all around him seems to be a little bit more stronger and faster than other uh, programs that are in the Matrix so I mean he's unique in and of himself um, what do you rem remember of the Matrix at all? I remember thinking I would be terrified to be him Oh, me. Uh, I think me too on a certain level I mean like I don't because later movies really do paint him as being like the messiah of some sort and I don't know how I'd feel about being a messiah for a bunch of people. At the, any save, the savior, yeah. Yeah. And and um, the idea, the idea of being able to see the code. Yeah, that kind of think, freaked me out a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah, and, and and just the knowledge, 
I think if you were going to be in the Matrix, wouldn't you just rather not know? Well, there's a, there's a point in the movie where there's a character that literally just wants to be hooked back up to the Matrix and his, mo- his memory to be erased of the Matrix. He just wants to be like, to yeah. live a nice, yeah. really nice, rich life, to be well off and just be like, yeah, everything's perfectly fine. Not Nothing to worry about. Uh, I'm back where I need to be because this is where I need to be. This is my comfort zone. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't, I'm not, I'm not okay with the, with this other reality, I want to be in the virtual reality. Certainly much easier. Yeah, which is actually a, a later point, actually, to the next movie I want to talk about, which is absolutely one of my favorite, one of my favorite I still movies. think the Truman Show qualifies for this. I think it could, tr- I, I, I can see he's, that, yeah. Yeah, because he doesn't know. He doesn't know it's virtual reality, that it's, he's in a completely different reality. He doesn't know he's in a TV show. And it is a created reality at, on a certain level. Yeah. It's just that everyone else is in on the game. Yeah. Is the only, is the only thing, which is, which which is kind of an interesting concept when you think about it, because isn't that that's that's gaslighting a person on such a weird level? And by gaslighting, it's I so mean so unethical, very unethical. <laughs> but in, and by gaslighting, I mean um, basically tricking somebody into doing into something that they don't realize what they are what they are actually doing at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. No, you've taken somebody's life from them. Essentially, in, literally. I mean, like, yeah. It may, I mean, yeah. There's another. Uh, there's another TV show which I didn't include, and I'll, we'll get when we get to TV shows. Um, but I want to say that one of my favorite movies is Inception. Oh yeah. And I lo- I love Inception. So the in so the idea of Inception, their virtual reality, is actually that um, there was this military training device where you went into other people's dreams and you got to basically play murder each other until you got trained to be a soldier yeah um in this virtual space in kind of this virtual space which is really a dream um and other people found the technology and have been using it to actually um not only just dream in some cases but other people in the case of leonardo DiCaprio, um uses it to invade other people's minds in order to steal information Information, from them um and that information could be you know government secrets and other stuff with the intention being that you wake up from a dream and you don't realize that any of this has actually ever happened so you don't know how it got leaked yeah and the you in the people you see in your dream are just you know the people you happen to have walked by for whatever reason yeah. or were sitting with you um one of the interesting aspects of inception is that um it later goes on to say that people who uh, try to get permanently stuck in their dreams because it allows them to basically somewhat live forever in a dream that just continuously keeps happening and they can do it. You don't have to age. Yeah, and that's kind of Leonardo DiCaprio's thing is uh, was that he got stuck there with his wife um, and they basically lived out an entire lifetime together in their dream. Yeah. Um, with just the two of them, they were able to just enjoy each other's company that they built entire worlds. I mean... I don't know how that couldn't be interesting to do on a certain level. Yeah. Um, but no, I, I love, I love Inception just for its, um, just for the sheer notion of it. Cause I don't, cause you don't get a lot of movies that try interesting themes like that at all. Uh, I think it's interesting that you can still steal, steal people's thoughts. Well, not just steal people's thoughts, steal people's thoughts, but again, the entire point of Inception is actually to, um, install a thought. Yeah. You know, to basically, hardwire a person to start thinking about stuff in a completely different way um, deep down to their own subconscious until it actually becomes their reality. I mean, if that's the case, I'd be scared to think of this technology actually existing and actually doing something like that. Well, but don't you don't you think, you know, keeping on the movie theme, that the uh, concept of the born identity is that you've somehow installed that type what? of... of uh, thought process in the the uh, men who, men who were sent out there. They were assets. They were, and and they had such bizarre training that caused them to be to do all this training that basically got them into such a weird place. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's a couple different movies where they kind of um, reprogram people with the intention of setting them back out into the universe. Yeah. Um, oh, what's a good example of that? Um, 
Millennium Man was uh, I, I want to say it's Millennium Man, but it was an Arnold Schwarzenegger flick where they cloned him, and uh, where, where they what they did is they took a brain scan of Arnold Schwarzenegger and then um, they cloned him, thinking that he had died in a helicopter accident, and they re and they remade him so that his family and so that it wouldn't appear as though he actually died at all. So this clone was had all the original memories, was a basic human um, template for him, and was able to keep going on without him. It's just that the real person didn't die, and because the real person didn't die, um, two Arnold Schwarzeneggers were running around, and the one Arnold Schwarzenegger that was the clone actually thought the other one was the clone. Oh. Okay, so th and then you have Gemini Man. Gemini Men, yeah. This is where that's a more recent one with uh, Will Smith and Will it's, Smith. It's Will Smith, and it's a younger version of Will Smith that's trying to kill his older version, who was apparently a uh, didn't go rogue, but it's said to have gone rogue. I guess uh, I have actually seen Gemini Men. It's one of those movies I kind of want to go watch, but uh, the theaters weren't open when I wanted to go watch it. Yeah. The next one, actually, I think that's probably the most classic version of virtual reality is going to be Ready Player One. So Ready Player One was originally a book written in the 1980s and pulled a lot more pop references from the 80s um, than the version that we have now, which pulled a lot more references from just about everywhere. Um, it tells the story of a kind of more... Um, I want to say thirsty is probably not the way, right way to say it, but um, a world that started to get starved of its natural resources that are becoming slightly more, becoming more and more limited. Mm -hmm. um, so reality. More, well, more bleak reality. Yeah. Um, and the way people entertain themselves is by uh, putting on a VR headset and basically going into this world called Oasis, um, which is kind of like a mixture of uh, Second Life, which is this online game where you get to kind of make anything you want, sell it, make it. Um, people have weird realities in there that are constant. Um, it's an interesting sort of game that's actually a little bleak on certain levels. Um, just because the way some people are just way too into it. Uh -huh. um, but basically the notion of Oasis is that um, people take have taken their favorite media and have made it kind of their own. So the lead character, as an example, drives uh, the DeLorean from Back in the Future, or Back to well, the Future. Well, why wouldn't you? Yeah, and then you've got um, uh, other various references come up, like there's a gun, the, the Gundam from Mobile Suit Gundam comes up, King Kong and the T Rex from there from Jurassic Park come up. Um, even the even the sets for The Shining are um, used in the movie because that's a scene for a hotel. <laughs> Uh, the big giant climactic battle at the very end of it is actually um, goons from this rival company versus everybody in their nerd nerdy nostalgia for various everything. Um, it's 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 kind of interesting because even the Iron Giant, which is this oddly beloved uh, animated movie, I from, know who the Iron Giant. Yeah, yeah, uh, written and written and directed by Brad Bird, who also went on to do. The Incredibles, Mission Impossible Three, and a couple other really cool movies. Like I, I'm waiting for him to do a Marvel movie at this point, just because yeah. I kind of want to see what he'd do with it. Um, but he's got this kind of interesting tone of family and of finding connections with people um, in his movies, which I find very heartwarming. At the same time, I, like I Incredibles will probably go I like down. the Iron Giant. Incredibles, though, will, I'll probably go down as probably my favorite Pixar movie. If only just because I love all the characters in it, and they're all, and they're all, and it's just so, like, it all makes sense. Like, it, there's no, there's no portion of that movie that, you know, it, it's a movie as if, if this were real, this is exactly how, it, how it would have played out. And that's what I like about movies in a lot of cases where yeah. they seem tangible and real at a certain point. Yep, they connect. So those are some of the movies that had VR settings in them. Um, I'd be harder to say that there's not a lot of t there, there's also a fair amount of TV shows that do it as well. Um, we already mentioned Star Trek. Star Trek has the holodeck, which I never understood whether it was the holiday deck or the holograph deck. 
So it, I've always known it as just the hollow deck. So H O hollow deck, yeah. But but I always thought it would be cool if it were named, you know, sort of the idea that it would be a holiday deck since you're taking a holiday from life. Well, not all. Well, not all of the holodecks were ever used like that. Um, so various incarnations of the holodeck exist throughout various uh, Star Trek uh, properties. More or so after um, Star Trek: The Next Generation, which started in 1987, right, um, is when they started to become more popular. Because even um, oh, did they exist in the original? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, but even in oddly enough, uh, so I've been watching Star Trek: Discovery, which um, I have very mixed feelings about, but I know it's decent, but I still have mixed feelings about it. Okay. Um, has an early version That's of That's with Jane... Uh, with, um, who's the captain? Uh, um, uh, no, that, that's a Voyager. Oh, so uh, Voyager. Ca- Catherine thinking. Janeway is the Voy- okay. is on Voyager, uh, which takes place in the 24th century. Uh, no, Discovery is kind of the early version of what came before the original Star Trek series. Oh, Oh, okay. um, and so, but it constantly repaints the world as being a lot more technologically advanced than what was original. Okay. Um, so, it's, I mean, not that I would have expected it to look like the original Star Trek series on any particular level, um, but it's a very, very dark lighting, is the way to put it. Like, okay. dark mood lighting. I, I, would ex- I was expecting a lot more, like, bright interiors and, you know, um, more... Maybe more metallic kind of interiors, but it, the sets in Discovery always kind of give me the, the it, as if um, as if it's the oh well, we always thought it wanted it to be like this, but instead of being like no, it was actually like this. Okay. Um, I'm trying to find a great way to describe that. It's um, like if you went to go drive a car like a really fast automobile, and you thought oh I thought the driving experience would be this, but it's actually not what it not what it yeah, should be. Yeah. You no, know, my favorite is when I talk to people on the phone quite a bit and I expect them to look a certain way and then they don't look that way. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. Just like that. Yeah. Uh, it's it, it it's kind of a little bit of the same with Star Trek, I think or Star Wars, I think. Yeah. Where the uh the original trilogy had this kind of dirty sort of metallic sort of look to it, but the prequels had this very clean aesthetic to it at the end of the day. And it kind of makes me kind of like was kind of jarring for me because it's like, where in like fifteen years did everything go downhill so quickly? Well, see, and I I would say that the the uh, the prequels looked more modern and shiny than the than the original series. And, and yeah, and yeah, that, yeah, and so it makes you wonder like, why does everything so dirty? Why does everything? Well, look because so- they're at war and war is bad and. Things have degraded, but I, yeah, it doesn't work for me either. I don't like the prequel, so so I'm the I, wrong I person. To ask. I appreciate the the sequel movies because they still have that kind of dirty sort of space look that I that I associate Rebel with. Rebel One. Oh, Rebel One totally nails it. Yeah, Rebel One, um, or Rogue One, excuse me, Rogue, Rogue One, One Rogue One, and then uh, the Force Awakens. Everything, yeah. everything in the pre, everything since then, they've I think they've kind of realized like. No, the fans really want this dirty, st- dirty space look, not this super clean space look. But you know, we'll give the fans what they want because I think the fans are what they're. The playing. fans are right. I don't think. Well, I don't disagree with that all the time. But um, so back to Star Trek. In any case, um, the notion of what the holodeck is is it's basically they take force fields in the holodeck and they shine light upon it so that it captures the light, and so that's what creates the different. Uh, structures inside there, and the hol- and the force fields can be as sensitive as um, can be super sensitive to what you can it can feel like a leaf or skin. Um, you can generate heat, so you can generate the warmth on somebody's skin or steam in an area. I don't know quite how they generate water because people get wet. Uh, same thing with food; you can somehow get food in a hollow deck, which I find odd if it's just light passing through force fields? Well, I think I mentioned before that there was a series um, in uh, in uh, Great Courses that, where this woman who's a physicist mm-hmm. talks about the, and one of the things she talks about is that the holodeck kind of nailed actually from a physics standpoint what could happen. Yeah. And, and she said it's remarkably accurate. Mm-hmm. 
and, and I imagine that's to, how to laws of physics. Yeah, and I imagine that's how it would work. Yeah. Um, so most ships in the 24th century have a hollow deck, um, and they're meant to be not only recreational but for training as well. You could use it for training as well. Um, start in Deep Space Nine. Um, they're not hollow decks; they're hollow suites. Oh. Well, because you have to pay to use them. Oh, okay. Because they're owned by the Ferengi, which are a... Yeah, Ferengi, I know who the Ferengi are. Yeah, the... I love they my, keep the bars, too. I, I like my Ferengi. <laughs> I like my Cardassians more so, but, I mean, I like my Ferengi. And there we go, okay. Um, and then, um, in, in Star Trek uh, Voyager, actually, there's an entire character that's just a hologram. Uh, so, in the early... And so, the early... Um, and so the early start of the voyage is the captain, uh, the uh, doctor and the entire uh, medical team get killed very early on in the series. Um, and so they have to activate what's known as the emergency EMH or the emergency hologram. Um, and so they activate the emergency hologram and because they just can't turn him off because they need a doctor around frequently, he ends up becoming... Um, more sentient as time goes on. The AIs for holograms... So he been, learns. Well, not only does he learn, he actually starts developing, like, singing, an interest in opera, painting, all these different kind of things oh. that he really actually kind of enjoys. Um, the only confine, though, is that he's limited to but either the hollow deck or uh, he's limited to the... Um, he can't leave the ship. Well, well, not only can he not leave the ship, he can't leave um, the medical bay. Because okay. that's the only place that has the holographic emitters in it, okay. outside of the hollow deck, and so we can only exist in those two places. And it's not until uh, some point in season four where um, he gets a uh, mobile emitter, which he wears on his left arm, which basically allows him to go anywhere, because the emitter basically is what's generating the force field and the light construct that allows him to go anywhere. Um, so that's kind of cool in that particular respect. Uh, later editions of uh, Picard, as an example, so there's Star Trek Picard, which I've watched all of it and I have opinions on. Okay. Um, I I liked Picard, but I don't mm. enjoy it because it's like it's like watching. So there, there, so I mean, so this is where I get a little personal. There was a point in which when my grandfather um, started getting Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's, uh -huh. and he wasn't the same person anymore. Right. And it was hard to interact with him because I didn't know if I was going to get my grandfather or I was going to get somebody that didn't reckon, didn't realize how far time had passed. So yeah. it wasn't the same person that I was, in, I was enjoying the entire time. Yeah. Um, and for me, I got to watch Jean... I got to watch um, Patrick Stewart as Jean-Luc Picard again. And that was great, but it's not the Jean-Luc Picard I wanted to watch... Because it was this very rundown, beaten down Jean Luc Picard, um, and I now understand why a lot of people were upset with Luke Skywalker in um, the La in the Last Jedi. Yeah. Because a lot of people were expecting Luke Skywalker to be this, you know, to have been hiding out on this planet, trying to develop this like super technique, and kind of he's kind of like a, you know, a. Uh, kind of like the space uh, hermit, I guess. Not unlike other space hermits, like Obi-Wan mm -hmm. Kenobi or Yoda. Yoda. I was going to say Yoda was a space hermit. Yeah, I mean, and it's kind of interesting that all old Jedi basically become hermits in Star Trek, in Star Wars. But, I mean, I was watching Picard and I thought... I, if you, you had that kind of knowledge of human beings, would you want to be around them? If, well, I mean, so what happened to Picard is that, um, so what Star Trek Picard plays off of is that they've actually added into the fact that, um, so the modern movie, movies of Star Trek, which uh, were originally directed by J.J. Abrams, who also did The Force, on, the Force uh, Awakens. Awakens, right. Um, and there's also as well as uh, uh, Rise of the Skywalker. Um, basically what he did is he said that the planet of Romulus, which are uh, the... Romulans live on basically ex their world exploded and that's continued to the Star Trek game which has continued kind of through the continuity of Star Trek um, basically when that was happening um, in the Picard series is that Picard actually uh, who was a who was an admiral at the time was trying to help the Romulans who 
basically his notion was like if we go help the Romulans we can stop being their enemies and they can actually see us as helpful we could actually coexist with one another instead of being yeah. at each other's throats yeah and he went to try to go save them and then the um federation basically backed out of it so he had made he had, he had oh, be- like Syria yeah so basically what he'd done is he had actually become Sorry. he'd actually given up his admiralty and become a uh he was following in the he was following Spock's example and became a um an ambassador essentially and his notion was that he was trying to help save the Romulans as much as many as he could because he realized that if he saved the Romulans and try to save as many people as he could that they'll understand and repay that in the future and they could have some sort of peace. Yeah. And the Federation basically was like, We don't want to have Romulans on our world. So basically Syria. Yeah. Um, and because of this, John Picard actually threatens, like, hey, if you won't do this, then, you know, you're going to lose a great captain. I'll quit. And they were like, okay, we'll call your bluff. And so he quits. So he basically retires from Starfleet for, like, 20, for 10, 20 years and goes back to live on his farm, uh, family farm in France and just make wine. And he's very miserable. Um and then until he decide, until he figures out that there's something going on that he thinks he can help, and decides to get back into action. But again, I would have rather seen, I would have rather seen him as doing his ambassador thing or something else. Like it yeah. just is not, it's not the version of Picard I wanted. I got to see a lot of other characters though. I got to see what some of the other characters from Star Trek had done, had gotten up to. But I wish I saw more. But back onto virtual reality. Um, it, virtual reality by that point, which is like 20, 30 some odd years in the future, um, has gotten to the point where you can put emitters anywhere in like a ship and um, the ship that Picard is on is actually f- almost all of it is holograms in a holographic setting. So it's kind of neat and interesting. Um, so the world becomes a hologram. Well, the ship is the ship is not a hologram, but it's, um, but its interior is a hologram. So, so the much that you could... Create your own living spaces. So his living space is actually his farmhouse office and 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 bedding, uh-huh. and other sh- and other parts of the ship actually have um, crew members that are basically just holograms of the main captain in his different like kind of psyche. Okay. So one of them's French. One of them speaks nothing but Spanish. Uh, another one is a little bit more nervous and jittery because he's a medic. You know, it's kind of interesting actually. 90s weren't alone in that. There was a bunch of TV, there's a bunch of cartoons that were, or not cartoons, but um, do you remember the Power Rangers? Oh gosh, yes. Um, White Tiger Zords. Oh okay. yes. Yeah. Um, so the Power Rangers were um, basically just uh, were basically just a wishing stone to try to make money off of. Right. And several companies, even the people that made Power Rangers, were trying to find new ways to make more Power Rangers. Right. Um, because Japan has this very large wealth of what are known as um, Tokusatsu series, which are basically masked uh, superhero sort of series. Yeah. Um, they have, they've been doing that for ye- literally years, decades. Um, and the Power Rangers were only, um, which came about uh, mostly in the 70s, really, uh, were just a portion of that, just a small itty bitty fraction of that. They See, did. I think of them as a '90s thing. So Power Rangers is a '90s thing, but we didn't get. But by the time we got the Power Rangers, there had actually been over a dozen earlier shows of Super Sentai series, which are what precede the Power Rangers. So the Power Rangers that we got was actually kind of I think um, was like the ninth or tenth or eleventh iteration of the Super Sentai series. For well, us. Okay, so we sat in a room, or stood in a room, mm-hmm. where they had all the Red Ranger uniforms from, like, all the way back. Yep. They must have been, like, 30 or 40 of them? Uh, at least 40, 45. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, this was the uh, Toei uh, studio, studio uh, basically. Yeah. Which, um, again, when we walked into it, we were like, oh, this can't be the thing. And then we got further into it, it was like, this is the thing. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no, again... So, again, there is a whole bunch of more Red Rangers than even the ones that I've ever seen. And they get, um, but again, so it's a long running franchise. Um, so, Saban Entertainment tried to replicate the Power Rangers with something called VR Troopers. Um, in which what they did is they actually took a number of other, uh, what they call 
uh, metal hero series, which are basically just people who were wearing armor of some kind. Mm-hmm. Um, so they took, uh, and I apologize if I say this incorrectly, they took Superhuman Machine Metalurd, Dimensional Warrior Spielbahn, and Space Sheriff Spader. Okay. So those are the, so those were the series that they created, and what they did is them. None of the three th- of these three series had anything to do with each other, but they bought the suits and they bought the film and they bought the and they bought the TV show, essentially from Japan and basically made it into a, its own series. Um, and the notion for this series again, because we're talking about virtual reality, uh, was that there was a separate virtual world that existed overlayered on our world. And the notion was that there was a portal that could open, that you could go through, you would become a metalized version of yourself, and you were protecting the virtual world from crossing into our real world because the virtual world had a, was a lot more advanced. Okay. Um, so that was and the, dangerous. And dangerous, yes. There was evil corporations trying to bring them over onto our side, as, as an evil corporation wants to. Um, so that was VR Troopers. The one I fondly remember, because I've actually seen more versions of it before, um, is a show called Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad. <laughs> Sorry. Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad. The cyber is spelled with an S. As opposed to a C. Yes. Wow. So okay. it was also it, it was also just, so the way it was also stylized was like four big S's as well. Uh-huh. Um, it's based off of a of a TV show um, in Japan that was called Denki Chojin Gridman or Gridman the Hyper Agent or Hyper Agent Gridman, um, which was a par- which was meant to be a so there's a series in Japan called Ultraman, which is basically uh, take a guy, you know, make him the size of a Megazord from Power Rangers and have him fight as some sort of bad guy alien creature. Okay. Um, this version happened like to be... Like a human version of Godzilla. Yes. Okay. Pretty much. In different in different forms. I mean, okay. again, Japan, for whatever reason, the Tokusatsu series loved their weird alien creatures, which is always funny because they never reuse them for anything else. It's a one and done thing. Where do you keep these costumes at? I have to know. I have to... <laughs> I have to know. Like, because again, they don't reuse the costumes. They they almost never reuse well, like going to the prom. You never go to the prom twice in the same dress. Well, okay, that's fair. But if you're going to make like all these series years after years after years, you would think that like you'd pull a costume from like ten years ago, being like, yeah, I think we could reuse this. Like you would reuse stuff you already have in some sort of way or shape. They never do that in these shows. So they just have stockpiles and stockpiles of it. And that's what the Power Rangers eventually did, had to do is that they had to buy. The suits from Japan, and they ended up having to buy uh, the monsters as well, so they could recreate the actual footage uh, when they weren't stealing it directly. When they weren't taking it directly from what had already been filmed in Japan. Yeah. Um, and so again, they just happen to have the suits still, and they sold them, so they have to have the suits. I want to see what this warehouse is. I just want to see their. I want to see this wardrobe. I just want because I imagine it's just box after box because they, they, they can't fold up. They're not cloth. They're they're foam armor and headpieces. I got. I, oh, and, and also think about it this way: somebody spent time making this, yeah, on a weekly basis. So they had like maybe a three or four day time to build this costume, and then have like two or three days to shoot with it, and then, and then it'd be done, and then it would just be done, and that they'd already be working on the next one. It's insane. I, I wish I could have seen that. that I, I want to see that warehouse because. There's a warehouse somewhere, and they're keeping them somewhere. I want to see it. <laughs> um, so anyway, so back to Superhuman Cyber Squad, which is based off of Gridman. Uh, it was this notion that um, this kid became a person called Gridman or Servo. Uh, Servo being the American version of it. Um, and he was uh, basically sucked into a computer, and he was fighting computer viruses in the computer that were wrecking havoc on other electronic stuff. So it was this very much this digital virtual world that he went into to stop uh, the computer viruses from wrecking the internet, essentially. So what portrayed the, the computer viruses? Uh, much in the same way, more Godzilla-like monsters. Oh, okay. Um, Sometimes they were more electronic looking, most of the times they weren't. Um, very interesting, actually. They 
revived this series uh, just a few years back for something they called SSS Gridband. Um, where the original version was a live action version, this one was an animated version. The creators literally went on to say that the SSS was actually taken from the American version of Superhuman Samurai Cyber Squad. They just repurposed the S's. But all the characters are actually named after a series of the characters are actually named after their American, the American counterparts. So a lot of the the character, the American characters, had their names used for the Japanese version. They're also modeled similarly as well. So I found that to be kind of interesting for Japan to um, take nuances from the American version of something that they that they that America took and reuse it in their own. So I thought that was kind of a interesting meta perspective which I think is kind of interesting for Japan because again they wouldn't have kn I don't know if they would have known about Superhuman and Samurai Cyber Squad they would have only known about Gridaban so all these American references in the in this Japanese show there are actually these American references like that's I think that's kind of an interesting I, I wonder about his fair play but I kind of wonder how much they I, I almost kind of want to want I want to I kind of want to go back to Japan and ask Japanese people like what do you think of the American Power Rangers? Are you even aware that they do, that we do this? That we've taken your shows and co-opted them as our own? It'd be an interesting conversation. You know, and then I then I also kind of realized that they take a lot of American stuff and and have kind of uh, co-opted it as well. I mean, you look at um, the Japan has but not they had the Bachelor. Come on. Well, okay, yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's, that's very American. And then we saw commercials for it too. Yeah, and it oh. looks like. And it looked like it was the exact same setup. The exact same format, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so speaking of Japan, Japan has actually had a number of uh, chances at this topic as well, of virtual reality. Um, probably one of the first versions that was actually what... Um, so the Wachowski sisters, because they used to be the brothers before, and then they became the Wachowski sisters, uh -huh. or, who are created the Matrix... They created the Matrix because they, what they really wanted to make was a show called Go, Remake an American Version of Ghost in the Shell. Um, so Ghost in the Shell is this is this originally a manga, but became an um, it's actually it had a number of different uh, French uh, different stuff based off of it. So it was a 1995 film, and then later a 1999, uh, 98 or 99 film. Um, in the mid 2000s, we had uh, a, a very good TV series. Um, so um, what goes to the shell is it's a future world, uh, give or take by about 50 years from now. Um, and it tells that humans have, um, have already have figured out how to go through a process called cyberization to become cyborgs. So it's the it's cyborgs are the notion of replacing human body parts with mechanical ones instead. Right. Right. 10 um, of nine. Well, not uh, seven of nine. Seven of nine. Um, but more like the notion that, like, you replace your eyes to get more telescopic eyes, or you. What most people have done is they've actually. The million Dollar Man. Yeah, kind of like that. But what they've actually done for most people, what they've done is they've actually um, encased their brain into what they call a cyber brain, and allows them to access the worldwide net and other things. Uh, virtually through their own through through themselves through, thought, through this so, thought process yeah so what they okay. see is they see like windows that pop up with like people talking and that's them talking on the phone essentially they're able to um, hack into other people's systems through their own thought process I guess um, but at the same time you can be hacked as well um, which also takes into the fact that it's not just virtual reality but they're also doing something called augmented reality so augmented reality is the notion that um, through a device or through some sort of lens, something else is happening on top of the world that we're already existing in. The lenses just let you see it. Um, a great example of augmented reality is um, a game called Pokemon Go, mm -hmm. um, where um, you're actually visiting real world places and they have um, stop Poke stops on it, or they have Pokemon around. Um, and if you hold your phone up to the area, you can actually see where the Pokemon are through your phone. So it'll place the Pokemon in... In the real world setting. So, so it can see where the ground is and it will say, oh, your Pokemon is like right over where the chair is over there. Or right where... And Starbucks actually had a very... It has a promotion with, with Pokemon Go. So almost every Starbucks store is actually a Pokestop. Really? Yeah. What, do you, what kind of Pokemon do you... There must be really hyper ones. 
Oddly enough, um, so depending on where you live at or where you are, did take did takes the type of Pokemon you're at. So if you're in a city city, you get a lot more rock and electric type Pokemon. Um, if you're out in the forest, you see a lot more grass and foresty type Pokemon. If you're closer to the beach or water, you get more water Pokemon. If you're in a more drier location, you get a more, more desert and uh, ground and bird type Pokemon. So it really does take into effect where you are. Um, well, yeah, that that part I, I understand because I know when I've traveled, I've traveled with people who were Pokemon going while we were traveling because um, you can get Pokemon that you can't get anyplace else. That's how I got my... Um, uh, that's where I got my. Um, what was? There's a bird in Japan that you can only get there in Japan. So I got them while I was there. Um, I got like six of them, so I can trade with other people, which I've not yet to trade with anybody. Oh, okay. But I got a whole bunch of them when I was in um, Farfetch. That's what he is. So I got a whole bunch of Farfetch when I was in Japan. Because um, he's only available in Japan, much the same way yeah. Kangaskhan is only available in, which is a kangaroo Pokemon is only available in. Guess where? Australia. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I know in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, they were all special things. Yep. Because um, we were traveling with somebody who... Who collects them. Who collects, yeah. Yeah. It was pretty um, cool. There's a lot of other games that do it as well. Um, our topic on Minecraft uh, two, a couple, uh, just a week or so ago... Yeah. Um, ...has an augmented reality of it where you can have... Where you can, through your phone or through another device that has a camera like a, like a tablet... Yeah, um, has the virtual reality on there, so you can actually um, see building blocks and stuff uh, for Minecraft in there. So you can have like a table as an example, and you can have you can be playing with Minecraft stuff on it. Or if you went to a park, you can see what other people have built there in the park, assuming nobody's come by and destroyed it. But then that's again, actually it, pretty cool. Yeah, um, and that's the idea. And so that's kind of one of the ideas being talked about in. Uh, Ghost of the Shell. The real topic of Ghost of the Shell is actually um, what is a human, you know? How do you know that you really exist or not? You know, I how... think therefore I am. Yeah. Because um, there's a couple different characters. There's a character that's a full full body prosthetic uh, cyborg who it's uh, dubious whether she realizes or not, or if it is or not, whether she's just an AI that um, the, uh, she's just an AI that's developed a human sentience. Or if she is an actual person who, who did exist beforehand. Um, the term being, um, does she have a ghost, which means a soul. So that's the ghost in the shell. Oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's an interesting movie because, again, it's, it asks kind of an interesting question at the end of the day. Um, the TV series goes on to not necessarily discuss that same philosophy, but it goes on to actually um, explore more of the world and what happens. Uh, the story actually centers around... Um, uh, the major uh, Makoto Kutaragi, uh, Kutaragi, and Section Nine, which is a division of the uh, Japanese Secret Service or Special Envoy Service. Uh, basically, they do a lot of wet work. I guess is the best way to put that. Um, the kind of work in which you want like really high security or secrecy yeah. that you don't really want them to. Yeah. You don't want anybody to really know that these people were ever there at any particular point or that they were actually operating wherever you were wherever they were operating at yeah um so that's section nine of this thing and it's actually and again it's, it's had a couple different uh tv shows on it uh the ghost in the shell um i forget what the term is for it um I, I forget what the ad, uh, acronym what the other acronym is for it but they've had a couple different tv shows that have actually been really interesting um, in and of itself. Um, the next more interesting one that came out would have been in 2002 with a franchise that's known as Dot Hack Sign. Um, it's literally stylized as a period, the word hack, two forward slashes, and then the word sign. Oh. Um, I will show you on our notes so it looks like that. Or it's written. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so what's interesting about this virtual reality is it actually takes place primarily in video games. Um, which is kind of the first one on this list, at least. Okay. Um, so the notion, uh, so the story in this world says that in 2009, uh, there was a virus called Pluto's Kiss, which basically wiped out the internet. Uh, it made it so that n any computer that would connect onto the internet would basically get fried immediately. Um, and 
again, being in the early 2000s when this was created, they thought the internet would basically control everything at a certain point, um, including, li- including like, traffic lights, airplanes, uh, just about anything that could be connected to the net, what would be at 2009. If only they were. If only they weren't wrong. I know. If only they weren't wrong. Yeah. Um, so a couple of, about two years later in 2011, they actually were able to create a uh, version of the net that doesn't include Pluto's kiss at all. So it actually, um, so you can actually get back onto the net. But obviously, because not a lot of people that have been developing stuff, the most popular game that exists is a game called The World. Uh, which is a f- kind of fantasy, steampunky sort of world uh, that various characters interact with. But because of its kind of shady uh, development by the same people that were able to uh, make a version of the net that isn't affected by Pluto's uh, kiss, um, there's weird, mysterious stuff that happened in the game. And uh, people are... It's never really outright said, but I'm assuming that most people wear... Um, headsets that basically, once you close your eyes, it scans your brain, and, it inter- and whatever your brain is doing interacts with the game, essentially. Okay. Uh, kind of like Inception, almost, except that it's a headset on your head instead of an IV that goes through your arm. Okay. Um, and so, people who interact in the world, um, and are kind of, some people are getting caught up in this mysterious other stuff that's happening, but not everybody is. Um, but a lot of weird stuff do ha- does happen in the game that kind of, um, are, are known are kind of odd and known to have happened. It's not as if you could wipe it underneath the rug and pretend like it never happened. People are aware. Yeah. Um, so the early version of this was actually um, a cart. It was an anime uh, in 2002, which was meant to kind of hype up the promotion for uh, this three-part game series for the PlayStation 2, actually, which was actually uh, the core of the series. Uh, they later came out with a second core of it, um, which included a anime series and three more video games after that uh, that were detailing future events that had happened after the first set of it, uh, events in the world. Um, and the main, in the first version of the game um, of the story basically revolves around this character that's stuck inside the world and can't log out. Um, it's not actually known whether they can or can't log out, but it's just that, they won't, that they're unable to log out. So it might, they say they're unable to log out, but it might just be that they don't want to log out. Yeah. Um, it's eventually later hinted that they're escaping this uh, kind of uh, abusive relationship from their parents. Um, and so the game actually acts, in this case, like a prison. Um, and it was a kind voluntary of, prison. Uh, a somewhat vo- a voluntary prison, but also, uh, again, it's not well understood whether it's voluntary or involuntary at all. Okay. So... Um, it's it's a little murky on that particular aspect. I, I think it's probably an actual prison, um, but somehow they're able to log out eventually for whatever reason. But again, the weird the world itself acts weirdly, so it's hard to say what the actual reason is. Um, the next one that came up after that, which is probably the most modern version of anime that does this, because there's been a bajillion spinoffs of this exact same idea, um, is a is an anime called Sword Art Online. You will hear me talk about Sword Art Online. I don't like Sword Art Online um, because it's a gateway anime. And when it, by gateway anime, I mean that it's an anime that's easy to to get into, uh-huh. which a lot of younger people were got into. Uh-huh. Um, but it's not exactly a good anime at all, from my point of view. And it's not to say that you can't enjoy something or not enjoy something at all. I don't enjoy it. Uh, but it's not, but it doesn't, it's, it's a very interesting premise that uh, they never do anything with. So the initial premise of this is that there is this, um, so VR headsets, like the, what they call full dive VR, um, is a relatively newer thing that people have been experimenting with for the last few years. And, um, they decided to come out with this game called Sword Art Online, which is going to be a. MMORPG, which again is kind of what you do with virtual reality. Right. And uh, they've released only 100,000 copies of it because it's in like, it's the, is that's just the initial wave of what they planned on it. Um, and so people that first log into the game come to later find out that they actually don't have the ability to log out. 
So normally, in like, if for example, when you're World of Warcraft, as an example, yeah, when you're done playing, you can log like out. out. Right. Yeah, they don't, because they're full dive because it's in this full dive because you're fully immersed in the virtual reality. So um, you can't just take off the headgear. No, because you're you're kind of actually technically asleep when it's happening. Okay. Um, and so your entire body is comatose while this is happening. You're so you're just kind of like most people kind of just lay down in bed when they're doing it, um, and their eyes are closed, but they have this uh, headset on their head. Um, essentially. So as paper, people are playing through the game, they're like, oh, well, I ordered a pizza, so I better log out so I can eat my pizza and I can come back and play later. Because I plan to just stay at home for the next week and yeah. do this, which yeah. I, I, I've never done before to play World of Warcraft. <laughs> as, I, as, I, as I blink ever so innocently and look around to the corner. Yeah. Um, but they find out that they don't have a logout button. And they can't find it anywhere where it would normally be at. Um, the game creator eventually summons everybody to the main town and basically tells them, oh, um, so you guys are all going to play my game now. And my game here is that you have to get to the very top of my super dangerous 100 levels and beat the final boss in order for me to let everyone else out of the game. Uh, here are the rules. If you die in the game, you die in real life. And, oh, and as well, everybody's player avatar is gone, and whatever you look like in real life, that's what you look like in the game. And those are the skill sets you have in the game? Well, no, no, these, you get different skill sets in the game, but those, okay. are, kind of, kind of some, uh, those are kind of the, the rules that happen. Because, again, again, there's a lot of people that were... Um, who are creating like the very kind of stylish sort of avatar oh, yeah. sort of look? Oh yeah, no. If you can be, if you can be a, a, something that's uh, in a virtual reality, you're going to be something cool. Yeah. So it'd be an example <laughs> of like you were in your panda, but then you, if you got trapped in the game, you suddenly turned back into a human, mm -hmm. even though you were a panda before. Yeah. That was that was the notion. Um, so there's a lot of people who. So everybody got, got very much uh, thrown off because there's a lot of children acting as adults, and a lot of children, and a lot of children that were actually adults. Yeah. And vice versa. Yeah. So, um, but the major hook of the, of the series was really that um, if you die in if you die in the game, you die in real life, because the way the headsets worked is that there was a microwave chip in the back of the thing where if you died, the chip would automatically overheat and fry your brain. So, um, what's interesting about it is that they say a lot of people died. Um, but if you're stuck in this virtual reality, how do you know if it actually happens or not? If you actually die or not? Um, I don't. It's not a chance I would take at all. Yeah. Um, but the big concern is that a lot of the time, especially in video games, you kind of have to die in order to make progress because eventually you'll get to a point where you just get too many enemies around you, or you do something incorrectly because you're still learning. And in the game, they they play that up for the first couple episodes of the game. And they really don't focus on it much, much more after that. Um, so it's it's an it's an anime that was basically a lot of wasted potential. Um, its first couple episodes were really interesting because again, it was all about if you die in this game, you die in real life. You know, what are people going to do to to either are people going to start griefing one another because that's the way you stay alive longer? Um, but if you do that, who finds out? And how does the society kind of deal. Uh, deal with it. I mean, that was my term paper in college. Is, you know, how, what, how do people create rules in the vacuum of other rules already existing? You know, why did we decide to drive on the right side of the road versus the left side of the road? Yeah, not in England. Well, I mean, but again, I mean, yeah. almost, almost everyone else in the, in the developed world drives on the left side of the road versus the right side of the road. Yeah. Uh, and you would think that would be the case because here in America, uh, again, we count in, in the English in the English language we count from left to right. Yeah. So you would think that we would drive that the beginning would be in the left, so we would drive on the left. But there are other parts of the world where we're writing is in the other direction. Again, yes. So yeah, and so you would think that for them, and you know, it'd be the opposite way. Yeah. And again, and that was my senior thesis. Like, um, and I use video games as an example because again, it's interesting that these games come out. And these rules in this game come out, but nobody says that these rules actually exist. You know, um, my favorite example in video games was often um, if people steal loot from other people that honestly deserve it, what happens is that their name gets well known across the community, and so they can't 
um, play with other people because those other people know that you steal, them. Yeah. You, you'll, that you steal loot. So you can't actually play with other people at all. So the game actually becomes a single player game, even though it's a massively multiplayer game. So, so, so the game pleases itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, I mean, like you basically lose out on all this ability to interact with other people because you were a dick. You know, which is kind which of still how it, happens in real life. Yeah, which very much happens in real life. But again, also the same notion of what is the acceptable way to ask to for a party in a game? What is the acceptable way to, um, you know, meet somebody in the game? Or you're well, what if it? What, but but at what point is it etiquette, and what at what point is it rules? And again, they're unwritten rules. Yeah, you know, the unwritten yeah. rules of how stuff works. Again, like as an example. There are the um, rules of the internet. So there's these number of rules in the internet. One of them being, I think, is rule um, 69, which basically says there is a porn of anything you think does, anything you can think of, there is a porn for it. Yep. Um, rule 34 is basically any male version of something has a female version of it. You know, there's rules like that yeah. as an example. So nobody agreed on these rules. Somebody just said these were the rules, and then everyone just codified it afterwards. Yeah. Which is often what happens. Somebody says this is the rule, and then afterwards, it just becomes the rule because that's how it was created. Yeah. Um, another my one of my one of my examples was that if you told children to go sit anywhere they want in class, they tend to go always sit in the exact same spots, to the point that eventually where children will know this is my spot, so I'll always sit in that spot, even though. Nobody said it was your spot. You just decided to sit there, and everyone sure agreed is, that yeah. you sit there. Because um, this actually happened in my piano class in high school. Uh, my senior year of high school, I took piano. Yeah. And I always sat in the same spot because I got to class early, and so I chose the nicer piano, the electronic piano to play at. And so at one point, somebody came up to me and says, like, you know, why are you, you know, like, somebody, somebody sat in my seat ahead of time, and that person said, no, that's his, it's his seat. And I had to actually explain to him, I was like, no, I just got here first. So if he got here first today, he can sit there. I, I, yeah. Nobody has assigned seating here. Yeah. You just sit wherever you can sit. But again, so Sword Art Online um, was, again, a virtual world that was basically a prison, much like the Matrix, but you had swords and monsters that you'd kill and... Uh, Oddly enough, this interesting world that had like two years worth of um, of game time built into it that people actually hadn't finished by the time two years had come up, mm -hmm. which is kind of impressive on its own to have two years worth of content already. That's, I mean, even World of Warcraft doesn't have two years of content. You know, it maybe it maybe has like if you were to play World of Warcraft nonstop, you could do everything in the game within about six months. Yeah. Uh, and that's, well, that's not stop though. That that's not stop, but I mean, I'm saying like, COVID, stop, yeah. bored, stop. Yeah. Like, you know, wake up, log in at nine a.m., go into like six or seven, and then stop. Yep. Sort of boredom. Yeah. Oh, those were the days. Um, but no, yeah. So Sword Online has goes on to they eventually get out of their <laughs> prison, um, but they keep going back into other prisons. Uh, other virtual realities, so they go back into other games. But if that's made... the world that makes you feel safe, well, actually, they don't feel safe in it. Oh. Um, so one version that the one person one version that they go into, he's literally going in there to save people that still weren't, hadn't logged out of Sword Art Online. Their the memory and data just got migrated over to a new game, so they're still stuck in that game. Um, and later they play a what it would count as an American version because it's basically a first person shooter. Uh -huh. So an American version of that. Oh. Uh. Um, and then later co keep coming back to these online worlds um, to exist in that even though they know that they can be that they've been trapped in it before. Uh, which I find kind of interesting. Um, but speaking back to a more modern version of uh, virtual reality and we'll you will we'll, you'll experience this for yourself cuz I have an HTC Vive. Okay. Uh, which is a, uh, a virtual reality rig that I have here in my lovely living room. Okay. Um, when I clean the floor, it's mostly clean. It is mostly clean. Um, but a little bit more cleaning would help help it out a little yeah. bit. Um, so uh, one of the first virtual reality headsets was actually it wasn't technically known as this, but it's uh, but it's referred to as the Sword of Damocles. 
And why is it this sort of Democles? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, the creator who created this in the late 60s said that it was the software, the name for the software. Um, but the original headset was so heavy that it actually had to be suspended from uh, the ceiling. And what it did is it had two cameras that um, projected light onto a, a basically a windowed screen in front of your eyes. Uh -huh. And as you moved around, it had a wireframe uh, cube in it that moved that moved um, perpendicular to what you were seeing. So, like, if you moved, it kind of moved and rotated with you as you looked around it. So, it was the first version of virtual reality um, to exist. To first version of virtual reality. And we're talking about the headsets. That well, this yeah, we're not talking about uh, more modern version of, of what people have tried to create for headsets. Right. Um, when we got to the 90s, there was a big push to try to uh, create the full version immersion or the full immersion VR setup. So there's a lot of companies that were spending a lot of money, including um, Apple and Microsoft, who were trying, and other a lot of more smaller companies who were trying to build the full uh, 3D sort of rigs and everything. So you were seeing a lot of people making um, headsets and f suits that you were supposed to wear. Um, they were supposed to give you the sensation that you were moving around in the 3D space. Um, Sega actually was able to, one of the first people to actually create um, arcade cabinets using um, headsets where when you turn the headset, it would recognize where the headset had turned and so it would see where you were looking. It was always in a fixed position, so it wasn't as if it was having to do a lot of uh, guesswork of where you were looking yeah. at or if you're looking up or down. It was just... I imagine it was just uh, potentiometers or uh, servos in there. They were just basically recognizing where the unit was in this particular space. But it was, again, one of the first commercial versions of virtual reality at that point that could exist, um, even if it was a very simulated version of it. Uh, by the time we get to the 2000s, though, most people see VR as a fad, and it doesn't get a lot of traction at all. It's, and so it's actually very much a dead thing by the early 2000s. Why do you think that is? Because to me, it's, I mean, I've, I've had a headset on, I believe it was yours. Um, but, um, and it was a cool experience, so I mm -hmm. would have thought it would have exploded. I mean, we're, we're into experiences these days. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is just the early 2000s through the 2010s. Uh, but that early period right there, though, I think is that because nobody had made any sort of revolutionary breakthrough in it, a lot of people were just seeing it as wasted money at a certain point. Okay, and it wasn't developing. It wasn't, it wasn't developing the way people wanted it to, because again, I think what a lot of people were trying to do was get the full body, the full body experience, rather than just a portion of it. Rather than just the visual to have it be something you could touch and... and touch and feel and okay. physically move in and track where your bodies are. I mean... What they were able to eventually do with a lot, of, especially with the body suits, was that, um, and and, and ex a great example is, is what really made a lot of, a lot of this very famous was actually Lord of the Rings. So Lord of the Rings um, and Weta Weta Workshop, which is the one which were literally the people that not only made all the armor and all the sets for Lord of the Rings, they also pioneered a lot of this um, technology is that um, they created these full body tracking suits where you have these dots on the suit right? and cameras track where the dots are in relationship uh, to other cameras. So they place a bunch of cameras in a room and you wear this kind of black suit that has all these different dots on it and these dots are tracked throughout the room so they can show, um, so they can use your actual physical movement for the modeled characters. Right, so I mean that's how a lot of but the roof CG gets done yeah, now. I mean, yeah. again, very famously, Golem was one. It was a very large leap in that kind of technology, and basically uh, m pioneered, you know, the full body experience. Because again, that you could get an actual actor acting with other people um, in this VR rig, and you could actually track what they were doing to the point where you could remodel it. You could take those literal model yeah. those uh, those uh, movements into place them into models, and they could act realistically with some additional kind of uh, additional gestures. And they eventually yeah. got to, uh, f um, Thanos is a great example of that in Guardians, uh, not only in the Marvel Universe where Thanos is Josh Brolin, but it's basically Josh Brolin's movement and all of his facial movement and animation is digitally mapped to Thanos' face. 
Yeah. With a little bit of tweaking here and there, but it's all, I mean, it's basically Jason Brolin through Thanos. Yeah. Um, but I think because what happened was that virtual reality hadn't taken that mo that giant leap at all, um, and nobody had really made any sort of progress. A lot of people were trying to make progress on it. I mean, even um, even Nintendo had uh, the Virtual Boy, which was this giant red rig, which was not portable at all. Um, and you looked into this red and black space. It was very disorienting, very bad for your eyes. Mm -hmm. um, it only lasted for about a year, and I think it only had like 16 sell-out games, or 6 or 7, maybe 16 games in total that ever came out for it. Uh -huh. It's a really big collector's item at this point to get a working version of it. Um, I don't want one at all. Just as a, but they're they're very. Niche. Well, there went the Christmas present. Huh? There went where there went your Christmas present. Yeah, like a thousand dollar Christmas present. Yeah, there we go. Like okay. working version, working versions of, of this stuff uh, of the Virtual Boy is not common anymore. Okay. Um, a lot of it is basically like show pieces in. Um, Either their museums or in a lot of uh, games, independent game stores in a lot of cases. Okay. Uh, so they're just they're not common. Um, but but we get to 2010 though. Um, there's a company called Oculus that was creating something called the Oculus Rift, which had basically pioneered um, a, this wearable headset that you could wear on your head that wasn't that heavy. Um, and then as well, they were trying to work out the controllers to basically do VR. Um, and basically what kind of ended up happening here was that uh, by 2011, uh, there's a company called Valve, which creates um, this marketplace platform called Steam for PC games. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you want to get a PC game from most in almost any circumstance, you buy it through Steam. It's like the Amazon of online video games, or video games of any sort. Really? Okay. Yeah, no. so, so... Not GameStop. Um, well, well, again, for PC games. I know, I know. So if you're on the PC and you okay. want to get a game, you usually get it through Steam. Okay. Um, so, but, they're, but Valve is actually big into this kind of technology. Um, and what they were able to do in 2011 was that they were able to uh, build software that basically created lag-free and... Let me reread this here one more time. Lag-free software that basically allowed you to do VR because a lot of the problem with VR initially was that um, you would move your device, it, the Oculus Rift at least, you would move your head in it, and it would catch up to wherever you were at. So it wouldn't anticipate. Yeah. Um, the Oculus Rift was also unique because it offered a first 90 degree view of your surroundings. So you had like this 90 degree view of, of your surroundings. You had peripheral. Per, you had this bit of peripheral. They've yeah. advanced that since then. Um, what was interesting about Oculus is Oculus was actually, by 2012, was actually bought by Facebook. Oh really? Yeah, that seems an odd match. It does actually, but they've actually, but Facebook's actually gone pretty good about leaving Oculus to its own devices and letting them develop their own stuff in a lot of cases. Um, and by 2013, uh, by 14, excuse me, uh, Valve actually created in partner with HTC, which was a phone company made phones in Japan, mm -hmm. to create the uh, HTC Vive, which is primarily. Um, powered by Steam's, Steam software. Um, and so the Oculus Rift at the same time has gone through lots of changes um, in technology and how they're doing. Um, they now have a version called the Oculus Quest, which is its own um, standalone device. Uh, most of these gaming rigs, so like the HTC Vive, uh, I believe the Oculus Rift SE, and a lot more other devices need to have a... Um, powerful device to operate it so yeah. in my case my pc which is a powerful device nice. yeah um or even my laptop is actually which i got i got my laptop just to be able to travel around with vr to take it to other people's places to let them experience vr actually um but you used to need this powerful device to be able to um uh, gent to to do all the processing for the headset essentially uh, the headset was basically just the uh, conduit for which you saw the saw the stuff in, and help with a little bit of the of all the motion tracking, but the computer would do a lot of the heavy lifting for the graphics and the um, positioning of where your character was and communicating that with other things. Um, but they've created the but Facebook has basically with Oculus has created the Oculus Quest, which is a 
standalone rig. You don't actually need um, cameras or, in my case with the HTC Vive uh, base stations, to recognize where you are physically in the world. It actually tracks that information for you, but you also don't need a computer with it as well. It's, it's, oh, how oh, heavy is it, though? It's not. Wow. Um, like You'll see with my headset, it's not that heavy at all, but the cables keep it from being truly immersive in some cases. So, like, if you spin around too much, you actually can trip on the cords. Um, I've considered actually putting up, like, a hanging, like, hanging fixture hooks on the ceiling just to hang the cords, but they don't go that far either. So, I haven't. Um, I also don't think my landlords would appreciate that. Yeah, probably not. Uh -huh. Nice smooth ceiling. I, it's why I've avoided putting too many holes in walls. Yeah. Um, but um, but the Oculus Quest actually, um, even though it's a standalone unit and it's not as powerful as a full computer would be, um, lets you play a lot of games on it and not need uh, the various base stations or cameras that um, have been required of the technology since then. Um, and that was actually when I was working in the hotels. There was a Facebook conference there, and some of the guys were talking about VR. And I chirped in, oh, yeah, I know about VR. I have the uh, HTC Vive. And they were trying to get me on the Oculus Quest. To, Oculus Quest. Had I not already had the Vive, I might have considered that. But my big point to them was that there was no killer app for virtual reality. Uh, the closest you get to that, I think, right now is a game called uh, Beat Saber, uh, which is basically uh, you take lightsabers and you, uh, you slash blocks um, in time with the music, uh, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, but there's no killer app for VR that really is going to say to a lot of people, come, come, come. I must come. have this. Or everybody's talking about it. Or everyone's talking about it or that would entice you to go buy a four or $500, you know, device at the end of the day. Um, cause when you look at, cause when you look at it right now, if you went to go buy a PlayStation four, when it first came out, that thing was around four, three, 300, $400. Yeah, and there was and there were some games on it that were wor were worth it to go buy, but those are actually like fifty dollars games. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, but that's a huge investment for something to play a single game. You know, and it, that's assuming that other games will come out that you want to play for it as well on that platform. In this case, for like a headset, though, there's not a lot of games out there to play on it. Um, even though there are lots of people developing for it, nobody's actually just hit that like. I must have this sort of notion, though. And what so, kind of game do you think it will take to be that? Because I mean, because because you know, the, it, it is interesting to me to see which games really did make something a must-have thing. Um, you know, you've talked about about Mario and um, Sonic making certain platforms must-play things. Mm -hmm. I remember Dance Dance Revolution and. Yeah, and uh, rock band and rock band because yep. I, mean, I had guitars and drums for rock band. Yep, so those we, were, those were also killer apps. But basically, was like, I have to, I have to go out and buy this because this is so cool. Yeah, I don't. I part of the pro, the two things have to happen. I think with VR as it is right now, the price where it has to become so low and the entry to barrier has to become so low that it's affordable for anybody to. It's more affordable for people to get it. Okay, so what what do you think that price point is? Because people bought PlayStations at three hundred dollars. Yeah, I, I think that if you can get if you get the price down to three hundred dollars, and you can eliminate eliminate a lot of the um, not necessarily hardware but the barrier to entry, that a lot uh -huh. more people will be able to get into it. But my argument still as it was with Facebook is that even if you get the price point down, you need to have some sort of killer app that really does say, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do this. And I think what that has to be, cause, so right now what a lot of VR games are, are they are short experiences or scenarios. Right. Um, mostly because you really shouldn't be doing VR for more than, an, more than 30 minutes to an hour. It can be very disorienting when you come out of it because you've been used to this virtual world for a long period of yeah. for a prolonged period of time, and your eyes have adjusted to these screens that are basically about as close as your face as your glasses are. Yeah, you know, which is not a healthy thing either. Yeah, and so um, I think what it really has to be is it has to be a game that you can play 
for a period of an hour and then still want to come back to playing, you know, an hour or two later. Okay. You know, um, a, a game that you could play for 40 minutes, stop, and then come back and play again, or if you really had to Animal be Animal Crossing. Um, yeah, but Animal Crossing, <laughs> I mean, mind you, Animal Crossing becomes a chore. But as, I, it, as I was I, saying this, as you got here, I was still, I was literally doing my chores in Animal I Crossing. I haven't done mine yet, to, yet today. I have fruit to pick. Yeah. And I have I, stones to pound. And... I, I still have to go visit the Able Sisters and see what kind of clothing I can put on my character. I got uh, tie-dyed skirts and tube tops for my character. Oh, I have a tie-dyed t-shirt. I have, I have tie-dyed skirts. I have, I have a colorful skirt. I don't know if it's tie-dyed. I have to look. Yeah. Okay. Uh, get distracted. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think there needs to be... Um, I think, and this is, this is me spitballing this, I think that if Nintendo partnered with one of these with with Facebook or one of these other companies and released a Mario game even if it's just a recreation of Mario 64 with updated graphics if you have Mario Kart and you could be in the cart oh no I I, I really do think actually you want to be Mario I, I so Mario 64 or an early, or another variation on the Mario 64 gimmick um, where you move around in the 3d world and you have to punch and you have to jump on things. Um, I think so that... So something, something that causes you to be physical. Not only just physical, but you need to have um, a certain level of... of uh, how do I put it? Um, interactivity. Not just interactivity, but nostalgic interactivity. Oh, okay. I think, I think what you need to speak to is you need to um, speak to something that's already really popular and put it into a VR setting... Um, I, I've I've thought about it before. If you had and, and and I thought about it before, and then I actually played it, and I was like, no, this is horrible. Um, not because it's not good, but because it's disorienting on so many different levels. Um, I actually thought that if um, so, Sony actually came out with a PlayStation VR for the PlayStation Four, uh -huh. which I think is actually a much easier barrier to entry because. Um, you, you've already got the... Because you might already have the PlayStation the 4. Console, yeah. Um, the VR set is an extra $300, so it's... Um, then you can get a PlayStation 4, you know, for the cheap if you want to get a used version of it. Um, so the barrier to entry for that is a lot lower than other stuff, but there's not yeah. as much on PlayStation VR either. Um, but um, Sony um, has this, like, stranglehold, stranglehold on uh, Spider-Man. They literally to the point where they didn't want to allow uh, Marvel to keep making uh, Spider-Man movies uh, with Tom Holland because they wanted to keep owning the rights to Spider-Man so they could keep making money off of Spider-Man. Yeah. Even though Sony has uh, routinely not known how to make money off of Spider-Man since um, the original Spider-Man movies, the first two movies at least, uh, back in the back in the early 2000s. Uh, they've just not done a good job of making Spider-Man movies since then. Yeah. Uh, but it's a cash money, and the notion there is if you give away back to Marvel, they won't, you know, you'll be the people that lost all this money that that could have had the next big franchise in Spider-Man, even yeah. though they're not good at making Spider-Man movies. Um, but because Sony owns the rights to Spider-Man, they could put Spider-Man in Sony video games. And they've actually, for the PlayStation 4, um, for my money, would actually be worth it to buy just to play the Spider-Man game on the PlayStation 4. Because you have a version of Spider-Man that moves around the city in a very cool way. You could literally... They literally remade New York City straight down to the buildings and streets. So if you had a VR version, you could be Spider-Man and you'd be swinging? Yes. Oh, that'd there be cool. Is, there is a version of it. Um, it's not the full, it's not the full like, downtown thing, but you can... Uh, you can swing it. So what you do is you take the controllers and you uh, uh, you point the controller and it shoots at web. So you have to like plan your swings. Um, and you actually, if you pull yourself closer to it, it'll actually pull you toward it. Uh, you can uh, crawl on walls and you can shoot spider webs at people. It's really cool. It's just really disorienting to be flying like that. Um, I think I think if what you did is you created and I think. Um, Disney wanted to get in on this, they'd be a good idea to, was to be, would be to create like an Avengers video game and have the different sort of um, heroes as 
different gimmicks in the game. Yeah. So, like, Iron Man would be all about, like, you'd fly doing the same thing the way that, that Iron Man flies, and you would land in places, and you would shoot using your hands. Um, you could be the Hulk, and you would have to punch enemies constantly. Um, you could be Captain America, and you might be um, punching bad guys, but you also have to be deflecting stuff as well. Or if you were Thor, and you had your hammer, and you were striking enemies down with lightning and throwing them around and somewhat. Um, even just a small suite of that could be interesting, and if you made it into an actual game, which is part of the problem, there's no games in there, they're just short-term experiences in VR. Yeah. But I think that's only because that's realistically what VR can do right now, is create really good scenarios and, and experiences. I think it needs to have a full 20, 40-hour game to actually be that killer app that makes people want to do it. Um, and I think if you had uh, Disney behind it, I think you could get Disney to you know really spend that kind of money to create this digital experience, especially if they were on the ground floor of trying to be that killer app. Yeah. Um, and it's, been... it's interesting to me that, that the apps that, that for those types of things have been killer apps have been apps that, that have a lot of physicality to them. In what way? Well, and, and so um, like Dance Dance Revolution, and the other big one was bowling and mm -hmm. oh, um, Wii bowling. We bowling again. I remember when I brought the Wii the first time um, for Christmas at the at the Palm Desert House, yeah. and um, and you guys that had a blast with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, but but to me, those were those were as you uh, say, killer apps. There were apps that got you active and moving, and were also communal. I think they also speak to the ability of what you're getting. The, the It speaks to, you know, especially if we take the Wii and uh, it's the early version of, uh, of Wii Sports that it came with. So you had tennis, you had bowling, you had boxing, you had baseball. But they were kind of Minecraft looking. Yeah, they were, they were, they were not, they were not that, they weren't all that visually appealing and a lot of those were just They simple. didn't need to be. They didn't need to be. Um, and they were all just very simple games that were really more or less experiences at the same time. Right. But what they did do is they spoke to the ability of what you could do in this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, th and, and another example of this is that um, when Microsoft came out with the Xbox, their killer app was Halo, which was this first person shooter sure, game yeah. um, that was kind of very reminiscent of the very first set of first. First person shooters and video games have not always traditionally um, done well on the console. The only one to really do it well, I think, would have been um, GoldenEye 64, which was for, for the Nintendo 64. Um, and even the company that, that had mediocre success after that one game of, because again, the controller is not as uh, use, is not as responsive as a mouse, although a lot yeah. of people I think will argue with me over that. Um, I, I know they've certainly killed me a number of times just using the controller over me and my precious mouse. Um, but again, I think it's the killer app that you need. Um, in, in, in the case of Halo here, again, it was this notion that, oh, this is what first-person shooter is for the modern video game console. Yeah, yeah, this is what it could be. Yeah, I'm hooked. I gotta buy an Xbox because I want to play Halo. Because yeah. this is where, because if this is first-person shooters, this is what I want to play. You know, because before first person shooters were just the domain of PCs. Yeah. Because you, because they're, they, they just were. You, uh, yeah. The, the controller is not a, the, the modern controller is not a good device for shooting and aiming. Um, but Halo was able to make it, make it so it could be. So that's what I think was. So I think, especially when it comes to VR, a killer app has to be not only nostalgic, but also has to uh, show the promise of what you could be getting if you got it. Yeah, and again, if we go back to um, Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Genesis. It was Sega's promise that, like, look, here's this character that moves super fast through this game. All of our other games move just as fast as this and just as smooth. Yeah. Wouldn't you rather play these games that move fast and look cool versus Nintendo, where they're just you know? It's the whole buffering issue. Yeah, 
Um, and even and again, even when you had the original Nintendo uh, Entertainment System came out in 1984, uh, the promise was again Super Mario was could have been a coin op game at the same time, which a lot of early games were, but it looked a lot better than the Atari and other games of that time, especially um, if you were looking at the Apple or the Apple II or uh, ColecoVision or any of the other computers that are out there. You know, Mario and its game looked much, much better by comparison to anything else that was there on the market. So again, it sold you on um, not only this cool gameplay and this cool game to play, but also sold you on the concept. Sold you on the concept was that, hey, this is where you want. If you want to play video games, this is where you go to play them. These are the possibilities. Yeah, these are the possibilities of yeah. it. Yeah. You know, or this is or this is the this is the you know this is the check that we're writing for the future. Yep. So I think, especially when it comes to VR, that if you have, I think a killer app that's going to need to be nostalgic and show the full promise of what VR has the ability to do. Um, I think that's what's going to require it. I also think I think Iron Man is probably the easiest way to go because it's um, it's about as futuristic as you can get, and it already kind of has the HUD system that happens on Tony Stark Space. Yep. Um, so it would be a very easy sort of thing to do in VR to make you give to give you that full kind of yep. uh, feeling that you are actually uh, Iron Man. I think. Um, yeah, I can totally see that. Yeah, but that that's. Uh, that's just my thing. They've also done uh, Star Wars in uh, VR as well, which I, I don't see why you wouldn't. Um, it's a lot of fun, um, and so you're so uh, now. Obviously, I'm not going to expect uh, for when we get to homework here. I know a lot of people are not going to be able to get VR. Right. It's uh, are there a, VR lounges? It seems like there should be. Um, there aren't. Um, I mean, impossible to do during COVID because you wear the thing. But yeah, I mean, but, it, they would have been they they would have been kind of like the internet cafe where the internet cafe is kind of you know disapp- all but disappeared. Here in other countries, it still exists. Well, in other countries, you know, most people don't own computers. Right. Um, I know, as an example, in China, you um, if you want to play online games, um, most people don't own a computer. But what you do is you rent you, that you buy time to play online. Yeah. So, um, here in America, though, um, most people, if you want to play those games, most of them are able to buy the computer systems that do it. Right. Um, or if not, you're able to get, like, a PlayStation or an Xbox or a Switch. Yeah. Um, which is a much easier barrier to entry to get into those games because it's all really built for you and it's at a yeah. very competitive price. Yeah. Um, but in our case here, because we'll be playing with VR... It's very difficult to um, experience it. So what I'm going to try to find is I'll try to find a couple of videos that are showing VR and um, the possibilities of, of things in VR. Uh, but next week, you're going to try VR. Oh, very cool. Um, and so I'm going to line up a couple games for you and we'll play for it. And then as soon as we're done playing it, we'll, do a, we'll, we'll record the podcast so we can have our immediate opinions on it. Okay. That uh-huh. sounds like a deal. But then I'm also going to recommend that... Um, that you watch uh, The Matrix here. Yep. Uh, The first one, at least. Because, again, I mean, it's about as what modern-day virtual reality will probably be in a certain level. Um, If you have the chance to, I recommend uh, Ready Player One as well because uh, that's a very modern version of what virtual reality will be um, in the coming future. I think Ready Player One is probably what we are dreaming of virtual reality to be. Yeah. Um, so if you want to kind of get an example of that, that would be those examples. Okay. Um, but that's what we'll do for next week. Wonderful. Um, and so we'll put my show notes that we have on here. And the next week I'll also talk about the different uh, VR rigs that you can get. Um, because there's a couple that if, you, if you're interested in this in this um, technology, there's a couple different ones you can get. And I'll um, kind of help you navigate that a little bit if anybody, if any of our listeners are interested in that. Okay. Um, so I'll put our show notes up on our website, the nerdtutorialpodcast.com. Um, you can also follow us with the conversation on, continue the conversation on our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash nerdtutorialpodcast. Um, and if you have any ideas for future topics or uh, want to see some of our other topics that we've uh, been following, so we follow all, we follow uh, the Twitters for all the different topics that we've already discussed. Um, so any sort of cool news that comes out for these topics, you can find it on our Twitter, and that's at nerd underscore tutorial. And so if you have any ideas for future topics, 
uh, nerdy topics on there as well. Somebody gave me a great idea for Pokemon. Oh, great. So that's, you know, that's coming up. Okay. Because that's a huge podcast. Yeah, 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 it's I mean, probably three rather than two. Yes, actually. Yeah, it will take time to play a Pokemon game. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, go ahead and listen to us. Find us there, and and if you uh, are listening to us on one of the various platforms like Apple or uh, SoundCloud, wherever you're listening to this, please do rate us because it does help the podcast out. Um, and I certainly, we certainly do read the feedback, so we can make the podcast better for people as well. Um, but until then, thank you so much for listening to us today, and we'll see you guys again next time. Bye. Bye.